How are you doing, Joan? I'm doing fine, thank you. Excellent, thank you for being here. Um, so you and I, in the uh, preparation for today's webinar, uh, we discussed that we would cover the following topics, which is that uh, we agreed that we would first look a little bit at your background history, and then we selected uh, several key milestones. I mean, there are many more within the company's history, but several key milestones uh, important to the Cine Studio branch of the company. Um, and you will take us on a hopefully very exciting journey uh, from A to B as an apocalypse now to Bluehorn. Um, so yeah, as discussed, uh, let's start with uh, a little bit of your uh, background history. While preparing this, we uh, we came uh, we agreed that uh, we wanted to start today's story when you started working for the Berkeley Custom Electronics. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, Berkeley Custom Electronics was a, a, a high fidelity store in Berkeley, very famous uh, for providing uh, very high quality sound uh, for home. Uh, systems. I mean, we had uh, all the kind of state-of-the-art speakers. We had electrostatic speakers. We had clips horns. We had uh, like AR acoustical suspension speakers in a demo room. And uh, we had a team of uh, people that worked there. A lot of them were engineers are going to University of California engineering. Uh, but it was it kind of attracted people to uh, develop this new exciting era called high fidelity where uh, FM radio was now uh, developed you know that was developed in the 40s so by you know during the uh, very high quality sound could be transmitted through um, the FM radio and then we had very high quality record record systems and uh, moving coil cartridges and everyone was pushing the envelope to try and get uh, sound of violins and sound of uh, voices and things like that to sound as natural and uh, as possible. And what, there was some of the things that were puzzling like, uh, you know, stereo was becoming a big thing. And uh, what we would used to do is, is play stereo in the demo room and then try to uh, see if everyone heard a center image did into the image but some of the people could hear uh, stereo and some of them couldn't even if you reverse the phase of the speakers they couldn't seem to uh, tell uh, or get a good image and things like that start so you start wondering why why is it uh, that some people hear stereo and some people don't and uh, I started wondering if if the phase response of the speakers uh, were interfering with that. I mean, there wasn't anything like speakers at that time uh, had tweeters and then folded horns. And so the tweeter was, you know, several milliseconds ahead of the woofer and things like that. So we started thinking about maybe doing some experiments to uh, see if we could solve uh, these kinds of things. As, as And so now, this is the same time that Steve Miller came into our shop. It was 1966, actually, and wanted to have hi-fi for his band. Uh, he wanted, to, and so we started working with Steve Miller, uh, getting speakers like uh, portable folded, small port horn folded speakers and things like that to create more power and higher fidelity, uh, which all led up to uh, the Monterey Pop Festival and, and doing this, this stage sound. Also, in the uh, same time, uh, we were trying to figure out how to create uh, more coherent, better sound. Uh, and so uh, there was a lot of theory at the time about the fact that, and papers were being written, that horns work below their cutoff frequency, uh, which was counter to uh, the theory and what was being published by Olson and things like that. So we built these horns. Uh, to test this theory to more accurate. This is a very accurate exponential horn, has a 30 inch uh, driver, it was built by Electro Voice, and the top horn on top has a 15 inch driver and compression. And you can see we moved it back and everything was done to be kind of time aligned in that sense. This was 1969, yes. And uh, this big speaker um, uh, was so efficient, it was about 25% efficient that it would bounce around the floor during when we were doing festivals. And so we had to bolt it to the ground with uh, into the concrete with bolts to keep it from uh, uh, bouncing around the floor. 
And <laughs> what's funny is it pulled out chunks of concrete right at the end of the show. So we started thinking we need to create a, a path. Um, uh, but we had a lot of people come here and played. I mean, we had Pink Floyd. We had the great, this is what introduces the Grateful Dead because we're in Marin County. So uh, a lot of bands played here. This was actually quadraphonic. Uh, and it was, so there was speakers all the way around. Uh, uh, so we could do quadraphonic sound. This was bi electronically. We were building electronic circuits to uh, kind of get away from the, we were trying to get the accuracy of uh, alignment the best we could. So this is a high fidelity approach to uh, kind of PA sound, uh, the, kind of the start. But we realized that the, these horns were gonna be really impractical to ship and move. Uh, so we started thinking how to, do this more portably, uh, you know, how, how we were going to build. And one of the problems with horns are very, very efficient, but they're also very big. Uh, and, you know, when, but we started looking at things like bass reflexes, but they're only a few percent efficient, but you need a lot more power, but, but power is becoming available. I mean, with transistor amps and things, we went from 70 watts to hundreds of watts, to even thousands of watts was becoming possible. So we started thinking, uh, uh, moving away from, uh, uh, say, such high efficiency and using more brute force power. So, so um, anyway, um, the uh, uh, textbook at the time uh, that was it was out of print. You can see Olson Engineering. Uh, a copy was given to me by Joe Miner, the owner of Berkeley Custom Electronics, as a gift because it was out of print. And it's what drove me to take calculus because without calculus, you can't read this book. But uh, because it's, but it was the it was it was done for at RCA and it was tremendous amounts of theoretical work and testing and measurements of uh, line arrays and everything was in, it's an amazing book, that, you know, considering there was really nothing else being published and it kind of like set the groundwork and uh, we were making uh, connections with the Grateful Dead and I, they were working on the uh, wall of sound and, and uh, they started to ask me, uh, some, I was working at McCune's at the time, building, looking to build smaller, more compact speakers. And um, uh, Stan Osley uh, from the Grateful Dead wanted to know, they were having problems with these line arrays they were building in the fact that they were, they wouldn't, they couldn't reach the balcony. They were, were very, and I said, well, that's one of the problems you can see in Olsen here that line arrays become, they become more, more directional than even their height. I said, even if you go all the way to the ceiling, we might not be able to make sound of the balcony, we should build a barrel shaped speaker or something or cylindrical, spherical speaker to, for better dispersion. So you can see the center cluster was, um, you know, my design, uh, they built it uh, using honeycomb material and things, but the, the drivers were mine and the top there's a row, it's kind of hard to see from the speaker, a row of tweeters. So this was a three-way triumph, electronic triumph system uh, to create uh, kind of, I think it was either piano cluster or vocal cluster. They were, we built two of them. I keep forgetting which one's which. But uh, the uh, uh, other thing that I was trying to experiment with is, is that uh, one of the problems we had, as, as you look at the phase response of a loudspeaker, it looks like the low frequencies are delayed more than the high frequencies. And so one of the things that it was, it looked like, uh, Reen Olson, that, that if you built the array big enough, uh, that should help improve the transient response or the low frequency phase response. And so one of the, I was really excited because here, here's a large source of sound, but it didn't improve it. It improved it a little, improved it a little bit, but uh, we're talking about in the low frequencies having delays of, you know, 40 milliseconds and 30, 40 milliseconds, and this improved it by a few milliseconds. So we knew we had to probably find a different way to eventually correct this. But uh, this uh, also the system was impractical a little bit because uh, the uh, uh, the band didn't like to be in front of the whole sound uh, for a big arena. So we started to think about doing things differently. And then I got a chance to go to Switzerland to do more studies of for high fidelity loudspeakers for classical music. And this is called was at the Institute. And we started building uh, speakers uh, for uh, 
you know, to play back classical music. And we had a lot of instruments there so we could record a violin and then listen to the violin on a speaker. And we had uh, digital electronics by then. This was in the 70s. So we had uh, a ways of creating uh, digital filters so that we could create brick wall filters between the low and mid driver and then delay them uh, to uh, start to see if we could get more accurate time alignment. But one of the ex things that we did in Switzerland was we took some very powerful explosives. They use them in vineyards to chase away the birds to, uh, uh, so outdoors when you light off a powerful explosion and look at it, it, it looks like a pure pressure peak and then it comes back down towards zero pressure. I mean, you know, atmosphere pressure, uh, but doesn't undershoot. The undershoot is almost very minimal. Small firecrackers have more undershoot. And when you bring the explosions indoor, there's a tremendous undershoot. Uh, and it seems to react in the room before uh, there's time. In other words, you see within a millisecond, it's undershooting and there isn't time for it to bounce around and hit the walls. So it's somehow, we were looking at these in explosions indoors, outdoors, they'd look perfectly the way you would imagine it would look, just a pure high speed explosion. Indoors, they'd look like uh, the delay, the low frequencies were delayed somehow. So it somehow sensed or saw the room. No one had a good explanation of it, uh, of what we were observing, but it's one of those things you just kind of remember. Uh, and try to see later, you know, what, what's causing this? How, how did it know this? Uh, so then we started building, um, uh, this was one of the monitor systems we built in Switzerland uh, to uh, have a good time alignment, full range with a processor uh, to start to build better uh, transient free speakers. I mean, tr good transient response. And uh, we started building a subwoofer for to go down to 30 cycles so that's what this those big tall towers were in the back and we did a demonstration of the system in berkeley uh this was right when apocalypse was being uh, filmed and tom scott from zoetrope uh, heard our demonstration in berkeley and got very interested in, in having the subwoofers over in the north point theater uh to, to they were doing a shootout with subwoofers for apocalypse because Francis wanted uh, a lo the low frequency explosions to be felt in the audience like well what he really said is he, wa he wants him if they're even in the bathroom he wants to feel that power of the low frequency so we started working on uh, a low frequency uh, down, going down to 27 cycles which was really low at the time most rock and roll systems really with measurement weren't going below 80 cycles so this was really an, an unknown territory at the time to get down to uh, be able to have enough power in the theater uh and fortunately it, zoetrope was film doing the rehearsals and and film shooting at zoetrope in uh, in the north point theater which was a 70 millimeter house that had a mag track that was synchronous with the film. So we had five channels of high quality tape, uh, you know, basically runs at 18 inches, 18 IPS. Uh, so that we had two tracks that we could use just for the low frequency sound. So there was five, I think five tracks or so. I can't remember how many tracks there were, but two of them were we using just for, because we were trying things like stereo, low frequency, mono, low frequency, things like what, and uh, they were recording explosions from out and uh, and bringing them in, and uh, you know, work. We worked about almost three months on this it, until they got the sound that they were looking for, uh, and uh, I think we equipped uh, um, several of the seventy millimeter houses that opened up with that film. Uh, after that, uh, Francis invited us up to. There, he was develop, filming one from the heart. And he wanted to, there was, I guess they were going to jump through a plate glass window in the film and he wanted to record the plate glass broke, being broken. So Mickey and I went up there uh, and uh, what he had, he had a piece of plate glass, which was a couple of meters back, three or four meters. It was a big piece of plate glass. It was, they bought a uh, heavy plate glass, very thick and uh, very strong. And so what we were going to do is, and he put it in the, opening of the winery with all the barrels and things. And then Mickey was going to swing a log through it to, uh, with a tied to a rope to bust it all at once and have this great crash. 
uh, we practiced with, uh, since we had three tape recorders, three Nagras, we bracketed them so that the, and, and experimented with just window uh, glass from uh, big pieces of uh, quarter inch window glass, heavy window glass to kind of get a balance. So what the tape recorders were set up so that two of them, were, we had each one bracketed down like 30 dB or something. So there were two, the, the needles wouldn't even move. And the last one, we were just getting a barely a needle movement when we were breaking the glass. When we broke the plate glass, the first two tape recorders completely overloaded to give you an idea how much louder this was. And the last one came up to zero. So we just barely caught it. And it was a really amazing experience to feel uh, a chunk of glass like that break being standing in front of it. Coppola looked at me and said, uh, uh, we got to do this for the movie. We got to do this. And this was way beyond our technology in terms of sound pressure level at that time. Uh, but digital was coming into effect. And uh, one of the problems with digital with the digital tape recorders is that they that you have to make sure that you get out of the audio band so by 20,000 cycles uh you want to be you want to get rid of any frequencies above that from audio because you you have to be uh completely gone by 22,000 so that the uh, clock rate at that time was i think 44 uh for on the video system so that you wouldn't get aliasing and the filters created a lot of uh a high frequency delay in order to create that kind of steepness. And it's interesting because the industry kind of made a deal that they wouldn't uh, have square waves anymore uh, published and or printed on anything so that people couldn't see this. Um, but actually I had an idea how to fix this and using, you know, uh, kind of delay, uh, I was getting really good at thinking about how to delay different frequencies. And so we built this little module, which was delay correction for, uh the tape recorders and we sold these modules to fix the high frequency delay uh that was introduced by these aliasing filters into the and we sold quite a few of these things people could actually hear it they were put little a b switches on so this became quite popular to fix but what it really did is it taught the industry these were audible things and uh you should fix this stuff rather than try to bury it as it doesn't matter or we're phase deaf i mean we still were on the idea at that time that we were phase deaf but this kind of started opening up the idea at least in the hi-fi community that we weren't phase deaf because you could have people listen to, to this and then we started building uh one of the things that a subwoofer came out at the time uh i, I think it was a, called servo sub or something like that it had a servo motor and a rubber, kind of a big rubber band driving a 15 inch speaker. And everyone thought it was amazing because it had a very big bassy sound to it, a very high quality bassy sound. We measured one, we got one and measured it and found the low frequencies that was extremely delayed because of this mechanism. And it's separate. And so when you looked at the impulse response, you'd see a big undershoot in, in which is uh, in an impulse that mean, generally means the low frequencies have been separated from each other. Because a, a true impulse would just be a spike, as that's all you'd see is a, a spike going up, coming down. It would be very narrow. Uh, and it means all the frequencies are together, are synchronous. Uh, this meant that it was somehow separating the low frequencies. So we came out with this Ultra Series B2 processor where I added the low frequency delay characteristics and in, in, in to separate it out so that you could create that sound. I wanted to show the Grateful Dead and that you know, we didn't have to do this mechanically, we could do this electronically, we could use, and that way you could switch it off if you didn't want to. Uh, and Phil Lesh wound up using this for his bass rig and, and uh, it, it would reach in and, and do the controls. So my goal was to build really quality linear speakers and then manipulate it electronically. So ultimately this, I felt we should all move up to the mixing console or uh, with plugins and things. And that way we wouldn't have to build these things as processors, this was kind of uh, uh, in between uh, uh, building processors to do some of these things. In fact, we I think uh, the M3T was also another thing that we built was to delay the uh, tweeters. We were building uh, tweeter arrays to supplement our systems uh, for like Frank Zappa that wanted to have 15,000 cycles in the audience. So we built giant tweeter arrays and 
the M3T was done to help align those to the main system and things like that. So we were, uh, that was, but eventually this would uh, move away. But as we had, we were working at the time developing, we did an experiment with the Grateful Dead outdoors of injecting periodic noise into the sound at very, very low level, like 40 dB below the music to see if we could recover it using time averaging to get the frequency response of the speaker systems in a stadium. The problem is, is that the audience somehow could hear this little uh, buzzing sound uh, because we, you know, even though I couldn't hear it, but they tuned into it somehow. So we started realizing that we were gonna have to build a way of measuring using music itself as the source and not uh, try to use uh, buried signals. And so as we were experimenting with building what we now call SIM, uh, we needed a speaker to test uh, something that would be accurate and stable that we could take into the field and mount on a stand and have something very, very accurate amplitude and phase wise. So if the microphones, multiple microphones we have out there got hurt uh, or dropped, we could see, uh, we could measure with, and this speaker was designed to work at a half a meter so you could place the microphone there and see if it was working okay. So, you, and every single speaker was calibrated uh, and it was corrected both for amplitude and phase. You can see the amplitude is very, very, very flat. And the phase response from 100 to 16,000 cycles was very flat. So you could see uh, any kind of disturbance with, um, uh, on a microphone that's been dropped or something like that. But, but then uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, Roger Nichols, uh, heard our speakers in the lab and decided that he had to have this to do a recording and stayed around three days and uh, brought and convinced us that we needed to do this and we couldn't build a speaker like this and not uh, introduce it. We were only going to build this as a microphone tester. We had no intention of building this as a studio monitor, but he convinced us that uh, he would do he was going to do a Ricky Jones album and he would do a mix down at the AES in front of, and everybody could be there and we had these speakers. And so we had the uh, Meg big multi-channel and then that was, it was doing a live mix down at the AES and uh, people were listening to these, these HD ones. And I think we took orders for hundreds of these things and we had no way of figuring out how we could build so many speakers. It was really, uh, kind of a, a startling thing, you know, uh, but it became, uh, and this is about the best you can do with a analog. Uh, this is like a basic a 50th order corrected system. And that's about the limit before you start the analog becomes kind of unstable. It's hard to get parts precision enough to uh, not create problems or they just becomes unstable. So this is about the limits of what you can do analog. So in order to prove the low frequency response, we knew we had to go to something more precise, uh, which was uh, the digital had that promise. Uh, but you can see originally uh, we had all those little controls were for uh, alignment so that the thing would be, so every single one was aligned in a chamber. Uh, the X10 was the next project. Uh, we were trying to see if we could get the distortion of loudspeakers down like generally the you know to try and get a speaker a woofer like that or a cone to move accurately back and forth and be linear uh is very very difficult uh it's kind of uh they're kind of like tubes in the sense they're inherently linear but not super linear and feedback is a great way of uh, uh fixing uh, non-linear systems by using a feedback and as a correction signal so this is a project we did with the university of california and they decided that the best way to do this is to have a linear device, like a microphone, pick up the sound from a nonlinear thing. Rather than, if you put a piezo on the cone, then you have a nonlinear thing reading a nonlinear thing, and it becomes really hard to fix. We're having a linear solution, looking at a nonlinear thing, and they show that we, they could get with high, with about 50 dB of feedback, which is a lot of feedback. Uh, you can reduce distortion about five times. So they were the woofer they were looking at when we did this, I think it was an Aurora or, or, or some kind of woofer they were experimenting with, it had about 25% distortion and they could reduce it to five. And I argued that we could, we could actually, we could start at about 5% distortion already. We were at that far along and this would reduce it down below a percent. So we, we built the X10. 
The problem is, is that even when this thing is idling, it still has 50 dB of feedback. So when you play on any low frequency sound in the room, it sees it as an error and corrects it and kills it. So when we had the HD1 on top of the speakers, you play it, you couldn't even hear the low frequency. With this thing would just gobble it up and make it disappear. <laughs> it's a very, very difficult problem to solve. And we've thought about it ever since, how to figure out what you want to solve and what you don't want to solve. And what, you know, this means that any bass instrument or anything in the room, this thing will cancel. Even when you move the, open the door, you can see the thing wildly swing trying to fix the change of air <laughs> pressure. The servo goes from a half hertz to about 2000 cycles for the, for the thing. So it sees any pressure change at all. Realize we couldn't really use this for PA. Uh, so we started to go back towards seeing if we could make the drivers more linear, like, like you know, directly coherently linear. So this led on the path that we were gonna have to build uh, more linear loudspeakers directly. And that's one of the reasons we have all that facility to build loudspeakers is to, is to keep refining it. The, um, this is Pearson. We built this room to have a space that was rather than a warehouse space or an outdoor space, more like a theater. So people would be in a space they were familiar with. This room is completely floating. Uh, the walls and the floor is all like a box in other words that's, that's coupled and so that's floating on a suspension system and the ceiling is independent it's floating from the roof so this room is completely isolated from low you know from vibration and sound so that we were so we wouldn't be hearing uh, rattles of trucks going down the street and things like that and this gave us and then this was our first uh a room that we put Constellation into where we wanted to be able to change the acoustics of the space. So this was our first project with uh, creating uh, environments where we could change the acoustics. And we did this linearly when we were the, uh, all the acoustical systems for reverberation pretty much uh, out there were basically uh, kind of nonlinear uh, systems in a sense that they they didn't care about phase and, they, and things like that. So one of the things we want to do is make this room accurately to like a real space. In other words, reflections of the room would be like a real reflection. And, and so a singer that sings in vibrato uh, hears the reflection of that vibrato and they expect it to be co coherent like the way they hear it in a real room and we wanted to be able to duplicate that so we were the first ones that really approached linear theory to a constellation system which which meant all the speakers and everything had to be linear so and small and so we have a complete system uh that we were working with and also working with the university of california uh, on this and then eventually that was our first installation in, in University of California with Zellerbach Hall to, to, to experiment with a bigger space and uh, get more feedback from people that actually play music. Uh, moving along the path, um, a long time elapsed and then we decided to build a, a studio monitor for the cinema industry that needed something that would work uh, the HD1 was very popular, but it was a near field monitor designed to work in a, in a you know, meter, half a meter to a meter. It wasn't designed to work. This was, they needed something to work at two, two and two and a half meters away uh, and reach their cinema level, which is like, you know, the sympathy level level that they want at the mixed position to do 5.1 and 7.1 so they could work in rooms with the speakers being further away. Uh, and so uh, meant that this had to be more directional so we wouldn't get so much console bounce. So we worked and developed this speaker and a subwoofer that goes along with it with a base management system so that uh, the different kinds of rooms, or different theaters and uh, can set up the base management the way they want it to work. So uh, this this also had very flat phase characteristics similar to the HD1, which we are as a base mark, but did still, uh, we didn't correct it uh, below um, uh, 100 Hertz. It just becomes really, really difficult. You get a lot, you know, to do that still. So this was basically 
uh, to be similar to the HD1, but designed to work further away. Uh, you can use it, I mean, in here he's showing it's about a little over a meter and a half away, but they can, but typically we see them set up further away than that. Uh, and these also become very popular for some front house mixers and live shows too, because they're very accurate and they're very powerful. Uh, and they're very uh, coherent, which was, uh, and one of the, some of the mixers told me when we went up to Skywalker uh, is uh, they like working on them because they can work all day and not get fatigued. Uh, and I thought that was, uh, that's always exciting to hear how people interpret the technology that you're building. John, would you feel that these are also suitable for domestic audio? Yeah, now with, uh, with being trapped in the house uh, and uh, we'll probably be more cautious going forward, it'd be nice to have uh, in the living room to uh, to be able to hear uh, they're really high fidelity it's really you know and, and uh, we have actually a friend of ours a mathematician uh, that teaches at Stanford but had was an audiophile and he had really expensive big stacks of strange looking speakers to me and he got a pair of these and <laughs> it, he just says it's a, he, when we went over to a party, the first thing he did is dr brought it up to his room so Helen and I could hear the MEs in his room. He says, people come over and they can't believe the fidelity of these things. These are really super accurate. There's like, they're like a high resolution lens. It's kind of like when in the 50s we had high resolution lenses in the movie industry. Uh, then people like Agfa uh, not, yeah, uh, in Switzerland were, ad uh, were adapting those lenses to a uh, camera so that you could take advantage of those super high resolution lenses that were built for the movie industry. So they're really, movie people really want to hear errors and they want to hear stuff accurately. They, you know, a lot of speakers, you know, sound nice, you know, like ribbon drivers or, co you know, there are a lot of speakers out there that have a very nice sound to them and, and they create sound and people, you know, so that's why a lot of speakers sound so different, but uh, when you have someone that's doing work and they want to make sure that when they go from this room to the big room, like the stag theater, they want to make sure that it translates. In other words, they, they don't want to start all over again because they go to a new speaker system. So this, in me, that was also its thing is to make sure that it had the quality of the big systems were in the big rooms. So delay integration uh, is also another milestone in, in, in this story because um, uh, immersive, uh, immersive audio and spatial mixing is something that we've been doing for decades. That being said, with uh, Space Map Go uh, soon to be released, which brings it into, into, the, uh, into the realm of uh, every, you know, everybody will have access to it. But, but delay integration plays a big part in that because why is it so important that once you go immersive, once you go spatial, that all these loudspeakers are face compliant with each other? Well, one of the things that uh, we started a while back is to uh, redo the experiments of how does everyone hear stereo? Does everyone hear positioning in the same way? Uh, which was the whole start of uh, kind of uh, looking at that problem all over again. It ha if you go on the internet, try to research, there's a lot of stuff about speakers and placement and angles and 45 degrees or 60 degrees apart and all this, all these kinds of things. And we we're starting to figure out, uh, you know, how, how, how do people hear stereo? So we set up a room to start to listen to very accurate, that was, we'll talk about later, but the Blue Horn project really started out to be a precision way of testing this idea and having people come in and listen to music and listen and we start out playing uh, like something that has a very good center, focal center channel or whistling and playing uh, simpler music that has, it was simply recorded, which has, where people were positioned around the room and we wanted to find out, does everyone hear this the same way? Do we all hear stereo or these complex mixes the same way? Does everyone hear left or center left and all these kinds of ideas the same way uh, rather than, uh, and how much do the speakers where they are make a difference for each other. And we started finding out that, especially with the blue horn, which was super accurately face corrected, uh, that it didn't really matter where the speakers were placed as we did more and more experiments. It seemed like the images were independent of the speakers. And this is the first time this has really happened to us where we start to realize that the imaging, the speakers kind of give themselves away. And I'm, I'm a believer, it's the phase response that helps us figure out where it is. I mean, phase response, I mean, if we look at 
what phase response really is. It's, it's the time part of signals. I mean, echoes are basically um, a sound that the room modifies with and changes its phase response or time response. Uh, and that's how we figured out we're in a room. So we're very good at solving problems with the phase response. We just don't think about it uh, that way. And, and it's turning out that it looks like the phase response is way more important than we, than we really gave it credit for. It, it was a dimension that's very difficult to correct. And so uh, it was, and, and there were theories, I, I mean, going back to Hemholtz, uh, which we reread, Careful, Hemholtz never said we were phased at. What Hemholtz says very clearly is that when you take five organ pipes and synchronize them together and create a square wave, which he could do at the time using the Scott recorder that was in, developed in uh, uh, at that 1860 or whatever it was in France to, to look at waveforms in the room, he saw that when you had a square wave with the organ pipes synchronous and when you made them unsynchronous, and you didn't get a square wave anymore, it sounded the same. So that, and that test you can repeat. So we're not sensitive to a, a square wave in its tones particularly. And that led to the idea that we're phased at, but that particular situation is difficult to detect uh, for whatever reason. But that doesn't mean that you can't tell you're in a room when someone, uh, when you hear the echoes and that we're very good at hearing and those, that's just another form of phase error. So I think that we kind of miss, we got misled with that, that experiment or, or took it too much. And so the more that we face correct, the more it seems like the speakers disappear. So what we're really hoping for is that we can get away with a sparse number of speakers in a room to create the illusion of, of sound in different spaces rather than, and this seems to have show great promise in the sense that, uh, that we're finding that uh, we can create uh, with, with a sparse number of speakers, I mean, you know, less than 10,000, which would be kind of a brute force way of having it completely uh, solve rather than in having maybe 10 or 20 speakers in a space and create the illusion. So that's really what we're working on right now. Uh, but it takes some art because exactly how you mix these things is still uh, not a precise science yet. In other words, it's the mixers that that do things to the mix to create the sound of where things are. And that might have to be studied as an art more than a uh, device to, to make science out of it. But oh. the blue horn was really a result of creating a speaker system that didn't have resonances. I mean, you have to think about uh, the resonances, like, like if you have a resonance in a speaker, uh, like a drum has a resonance, if you hit it and you hit it again, uh, it changes the sound of the resonance will change the next time you hit it to something different. So how quick you hit a drum or how slow you hit a drum will change its characteristic. And so things that have resonances have very complicated responses. So you could, you could try to pre-distort for that, which would be a very interesting but complicated problem. My way would be, let's just get rid of resonances. We'll make the high frequency driver above 30,000 cycles so we won't have any resonances. It's like what you do with a high quality test microphone. You just push its resonance out of the audio band. That way you don't have resonances. Then they behave very well. So the blue horn was really based on the idea that in the low frequencies we could damp the resonances using cones and damping material and the high frequencies we could push them out of the bandwidth. So this was a basically a concept of using linear uh, kinds of ideas, not no servo or feedback, and then using digital to correct the delay characteristics to, to force the, the time back in the right order. In other words, all of the time would come out at the same time. So it's uh, in radio would be looking at the group delay, which means that you know you want your group to be coherently together, not spread out over time. I mean, the the difference between I think Heiser gave a very good model of this. He was saying a long time, you know, to try and in a talk, he says if you put a tweeter, took your tweeter on top of the speaker and moved it a mile away, it's a very powerful tweeter, and you and you rob, rob your noise and and you equalize it till it's flat you'd have a flat response, but if you, when you turned off the sound, you'd hear the tweeter for another few seconds. So it's kind of a, kind of a way of thinking about why time 
matters and how sensitive we are to time is of course the next question like you could say okay that's an extreme example but it does prove and like what Heiser was saying, it does prove that uh, it's, we can do it. What we don't know is how fine we are to it. So our quest is to build it as, it, it, the finer we make it to see what we could get. The Bluehorn was a whole project to really develop it uh, as accurate as we could, very high resolution. Um, you know, the digital was built so that we have over 120 dB dynamic range, which means that the filters don't have rings and they're, you know, the filters are, have over 120 dB depth. So to you put a tone in and play it for uh, five minutes, you know, or whatever it takes to, to really measure it accurately, you'll see the ring is really gone. Uh, this is hard to do, but we did it to kind of like, we could hear the difference between 115 dB and 120 dB, not me. I'm talking about people who come in blindfolded and switch back and forth and say, especially in stereo, uh, the higher, the deeper depth sounded better. And um, we were very careful with these experiments to make sure we weren't getting artifacts and rings and things like that. So this led to, uh, I mean, we have a patent on the uh, idea of how we achieve this, but uh, it's a very important uh, thing that we've just kind of discovered along the way that this might really help us do these things like space map more coherently. And even in uh, especially now where we're going to be, uh, you know, in different kinds of environments, uh, smaller environments where uh, people will gather. Uh, also, this is the cover of Mix, which is interesting about Mix being a, a commercial magazine is this article is very good in the sense that they really talk about it from the the sound guy's point of view. It's not like a, a commercial of, uh, but it's really, uh, how the people that buy this product, what they can hear from it, you know, so because that's really what exciting for me is to, is to build technology, which is a tool for uh, the people that uh, have to do, you know, work with these things eight hours a day. Uh, I mean, this is a, when we first got the Bluehorn down at Fox, uh, they put it in to do uh, Ferdinand and they invited us down to hear uh, part of the mix that they were doing and they were running a loop with the girl and the bull, uh, the bull was in the ring and uh, uh, they were just doing strings at this time and they spent like all morning changing the sound of the strings to create the mood that she is, the girl is realizing that her pet bull doesn't realize what the ring he's in is going to be, he's going to be killed or stabbed and they want to create that mood of her realizing what she's going to do. And what was amazing to me was I was really worried I wouldn't be able to tell anything <laughs> uh, is that after half an hour, you could start to hear that happen with sound. And that was really exciting for me because this is something sound can do better than visuals. Visuals are important. They're both important, but sound has this ability to create a, the fee, a feeling to the sound. And, and then John came in and said, okay, we're going to go to lunch. And after lunch, we're going to do the horns. We're going to add horns in. Remember, there's no dialogue or anything at this point. They're doing it layer by layer. It's an amazing process to watch this art form of uh, be put together to create something that will be in the movie for less than a minute. And, and this is two or three days of work. Uh, and so, I mean, it's one of the things that movie people have known forever that sound creates emotion. You know, and I think we just scientifically, that's, that's a very hard thing to measure. It's very difficult to measure. So I think it, it's like uh, hard to uh, figure out how to study this you know, other than watching people do it like this. Wow, John, that, that, is, that went by like, like in no time, right? I mean, 45 yes. minutes, amazing story. Um, much, much appreciated uh, taking us on this journey from um, Apocalypse Now all the way to the uh, to the pursuit of the ultimate, the, the, the Blue Horn system. Um, so thank you very much for your time and, and, and uh, being with us and uh, taking us on this super exciting uh, journey. Um, it was a pleasure and uh, I hope uh, people found it interesting, uh, uh, but I, I enjoyed uh, being able to kind of go through this. So... Same Thank here, you. same here. Thank you. Best to you and Helen, and, and please stay safe and healthy. Thank you. Thank you, John.
Um, so that concludes uh, the um, from A to B, as in Apocalypse Now to Bluehorn. Um, thank you very much, uh, John, once again. Uh, some final household notes, notes will be that uh, next week's webinar will uh, cover the uh, RM server on Monday in English and on Tuesday that will happen again in Spanish. And then uh, later that week we have another uh, on-demand a la carte Friday where you get to choose uh, what you would like us to talk about. So in order to make your vote known, we encourage you to go to the Meyer Sound user community Facebook group where I will uh, uh, start a poll right after this webinar. I will start a poll where you get to choose from Montreux Jazz, M Noise, and Frontville systems. And then one week from now, we're going to talk about uh, your choice. And that pretty much uh, concludes the household's household notes. Uh, today's webinar will, of course, always, uh, as always, be uploaded to our Thinking Sound YouTube channel, uh, where you will find also today's webinars as well as all other webinars that we've conducted so far. And that means that um, all that's left to do is thank you for your time and patience. And please stay healthy and please uh, stay safe, everyone. Uh, see you next week.